Hi there, Skeletor here, and we're back at it with this week's comic book haul. Let's see what we're looking at. We got Amazing Spider-Man 55, Batman Gotham by Gaslight, The Kryptonian Age Issue 3, X-Men Issue 2, The Ultimates Issue 3, and Miles Morales Spider-Man Issue 23. Well, let's kick things off with the, uh, I guess, the worst of the week, um, Amazing Spider-Man 55. Cover art by John Romita Jr. Uh, considering how much I'm not a big fan of his work anymore, um, it, 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 it looks good. The cover's fine. It's very misleading. What you're looking at here does not happen at all, but still, it's it's a decent enough cover. Uh, uh, still, you know, we're, we're working with Zeb Wells here. However, this week we got a guest artist, Emilio Lizo? Lizo? L-A-I-S-O? I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry, man. I just, Emilio. And I'll, I'll just tell you right now, these first two pages, it's the only time you're going to see Spidey. And it's good for what it is. You know, it's, the man knows how to draw. It's a little sad that we only get two pages. The rest of it is a dinner date. Kind of lazy writing dinner date. So, long story short, Peter is going out on a date with Shay, who works at, I think it's the Ravencroft Institute? I don't know, she's like a therapist. I, I feel like that's probably the wrong kind of person to date if you're a superhero in disguise. I think it was also probably a mistake to date Carly Cooper, but you know what? She was an infinitely better character than Shay. I, uh, I saw quite a few people online saying they think Zeb Wells may have gotten a girlfriend recently, which is why Shay has been injected into this. Uh, she was here for, I don't know, a couple pages over the, the, the last story arc or two, and now all of a sudden her and Peter are seriously trying to start a relationship, for whatever reason. I, I, this feels forced. Honestly, it feels forced. Also, the date gets ruined by Rhino, and I don't even know what her name is. Like, she's one of those, she'll show up in the video games. You know, she, she's that uh, streamer who's constantly trying to get views by doing supervillain bullshit. Um, I'm just saying, if, if you if you are sitting on the opposite side of a table with someone, and there's a giant glass window on, on your side, you should be able to see the Rhino fighting someone as he runs down the street behind you know, like I don't know, I don't know, this whole thing and it somehow she's completely oblivious to it and then Peter just runs out there in his civilian clothes and just straight up says hey I'm on a date I need you guys to knock it off and it works somehow it works honestly this this just sucks Look, Ultimate Spider-Man did this I don't know two three issues ago where it's just a dinner between Peter and MJ and Harry and Gwen there's no superhero stuff there's no special outfits it's just four adults having dinner it worked so much better partially that's because it was by a competent writer and not Zeb Wells but also we were learning things about these characters we were learning what their goals are where they are in life with this that this this felt like uh, I don't know a poor episode of how I met your mother if anybody remembers that show, this this is easily the, the worst one. I, out of five, I'm gonna give this a one. Maybe a one and a half, simply because the art is better than what Ramada Jr.'s been doing. You know, yeah, we'll say one and a half, just because the art at least looked good. Next up, we're looking at Miles Morales, Spider-Man, number 23. This is the start of a whole new story, Birds of a Feather, part one, written by Cody Ziegler, and art by Federico Vicinet. Vicentini? Man, I am butchering these names today, huh? Before we even jump into this, I I'll be real with you. This is um, only slightly better than Amazing Spider-Man. Not by much, just a little bit. And that really, really just comes down to there's superhero shenanigans, whereas Peter is having dinner. Miles is doing superhero shit. So that's, I'm gonna put that like just a little bit above. But this is Miles' first story since Blood Hunt ended. This is his first um, outing as a vampire. The eternal night is over. The vampires have been defeated. Unfortunately for Miles, that win didn't come with a cure for vampirism, and he remains turned. While Doctor Strange helped prevent Miles from becoming a mindless monster, the vampiric bloodlust still bubbles just under the surface, threatening to take control. Now, Spider-Man doesn't just have to save the city from supervillains, he also has to save the bad guys from himself. Going into this, I was I was expecting, I don't know, Blood Hunt's ended, Miles is back to just being a hero, so maybe he's gonna go home and like try to explain to his parents like, hey, I'm a vampire now, or he's gonna go back to school. I don't know if he's in college or high school, honestly. I, I don't know where the hell this guy is at. If maybe some of his classmates would find out he's a vampire. I, I don't know. I don't know, but we don't get any of that. In fact, the vampire thing almost feels secondary to all of this. Uh, they talk about it, but nothing actually comes of it, and we don't really see anything vampiric going on. The A plot is, is, is Miles dealing with his vampirism, and every time he gets into a fight, it, it starts acting up, and he just wants to bite the villains. It will be revealed that every time he uses his electrical powers, because he's 
I still think that's the dumbest thing ever, giving Miles like a straight up lightning sword. Every time he uses his electrical powers, it kind of weakens the, the, the spell that's holding back the bloodlust. So the more he uses his, his lightning abilities, the more vampiric he's going to become. That, that's basically what this boils down to. Uh, the B plot is Starling, who I guess is Miles' girlfriend, kind of. I, I don't know if it's official or not. But she is the Vulture's granddaughter, and um, I don't know, she's just talking about how much she likes Miles. And then Vulture shows up. And um, I don't know, it, it, it's a short issue. I feel like, I almost feel like I wasted my money. I definitely wasted my money on Spider-Man. Uh, as far as Miles, I don't know, the art isn't bad. It's cool seeing him swing around and do superhero shit. Uh, I really hope they kind of jump back into the vampire stuff a little more, because I'll be honest with you, that's the whole reason I'm even buying this, is Miles being a vampire. That's interesting and you're doing almost nothing with it. Wasted opportunities, wasted potential. I'm gonna give this one a two. If Peter was one, maybe one and a half, I'm gonna say out of five, Miles is a two this week, this month. Cause you only get one Miles per month, but you get two Peters per month. Weird, right? All right, next up, we're looking at X-Men number two, written by Jed McKay and art by Ryan Stegman. I gotta say, as far as artwork, my only real issue, the sword. Like. It's supposed to be a psychic blade, and it looks like mid-90s Spider-Man winning. I don't know why Stegman decided to start drawing it like this, now that uh, we're, we're past Krakoa, but for as long as I can remember, it's basically just been like a fire sword, but neon pinkish purple, because it's psychic energy. I don't know why it looks like this, that it's, it's, a, it's ugly. Moving on. This issue isn't really bad. Uh, we're, we're, we're heading down to San Francisco. There's a new mutant who just activated his abilities for the first time. And it's pointed out, it's a little weird that he does this because he's not a teenager. Like, this is this is a grown-ass man. And typically, your mutant powers kick in at puberty. So, maybe there's some kind of weird government thing at play where we're turning people into mutants? I, I don't know. Maybe he's a fluke? I don't know. But, uh, you know, his powers kick in in the middle of an alien invasion. The X-Men show up. Um, they do what they do. They they fight stuff. I gotta say, the MVP of this one is Joggernaut. He, he's he's a lot of fun to read. Don't get me wrong, the other characters are cool. Uh, we get to interact with Tempest? Temper? What's her name? Uh, there's an Evangelion reference. Get in the mass driver, Joggernaut. Get in the mass driver or Temper will have to do it. But uh, it's kind of fun watching Joggernaut get used like a, well, I mean, the thing's basically a human rail gun and Joggernaut's the bullet. It's cool, it's a lot of fun. It's a fun issue, but at the end of it all, it turns out that new mutant is the one who brought the alien invasion to Earth. And it's not even an alien invasion. It's, I don't know, psychic abilities that are manifesting a alien population? To the people on the ground, it looks like an alien invasion, but he's actually creating it himself. That's, that's what this boils down to. They figure it out, they fix it. At the very, very end of it all, they make it look like he died. The X-Men take him back to their base in Alaska. And th this one just bothers me a little bit. You're in a medical room, there is not a lot of space, and you're sitting here in a goddamn chair, man, you know? You're not crippled, you're not Professor X. We know you can walk. Get up out of that stupid chair. Honestly, this this was a solid issue. Nothing too special, but you know, it's back to basics. It's, it's when you think of the X-Men, this is, well, when you think of the X-Men, they're usually running around in like a jungle or a volcano and fighting dinosaurs and other mutants, and I don't know, the X-Men spend a lot of time in jungles. It's kind of weird, actually. I, I, I'll, I'll say this is a three. A solid three. Maybe three and a half. Solid three. There's also a backup story, Deadpool and Wolverine, Weapon Extraction, Part 8. Not a big fan of the artwork there, but it works for a Deadpool story. Deadpool and Wolverine soundtrack available now. Even though, like, all those songs can be found on YouTube. Eh, whatever. Alright. Now we're hitting the good stuff. Batman, Gotham by Gaslight. The Kryptonian Age. Issue number three. I, I won't lie, I was kind of iffy on this whole story. Wasn't a big fan of the first Gotham by Gaslight, but the sequel really finds its footing in that third issue. Story by Andy Diggler and art by Leandro Fernandez. Fernandez. Leandro Fernandez. We open with Professor Adam Strange. I, I, I feel like I know that name. I should know who that is. I don't. We're at the Fortress of Solitude, and it's like what, the early 1900s? Like, we've got trains. I don't, I don't think we've got cars yet. Throughout this whole thing, there, there's a expedition to Antarctica to check out the Fortress of Solitude. They don't know that's what it's called, but, I mean, that's, that's basically what it is. And last issue, they, uh, the, the explorers were saved by Wonder Woman, who was fighting 
Godzilla-sized centipedes, which I would not expect insects of any size or kind to be in Antarctica, but, you know, whatever. It's, uh, it's an interesting fight. Um, it's a lot of action. I like the idea that she's speaking Greek or something, like, the, the humans can't understand Wonder Woman. And I really like how her, she looks like a gladiator more than a superhero. I think that's pretty cool. Oh, uh, side note, you can go buy some Adam West McFarlane toys, look at that. He's wearing a spacesuit. Uh, we cut back to Bruce, who's playing the part of Matches Malone. It's one of his aliases when he needs to go get information, but, you know, Bruce Wayne or Batman can't be seen getting that information. So he heads over to Catwoman's brothel. Now there, there's a little mystery and intrigue, and it's, uh, I mean, he looks Amish. I'm, it's, he looks Amish. I don't, I don't know. The Sleeper Awakens. That, that's the big... The big takeaway from this one is the sleeper is awakening. And then we cut over to Colorado where we get Green Arrow, who I guess technically isn't Green Arrow yet. He, he's doing a little detective work on Batman's behalf. He meets up with this old woman who I'm assuming is carrying the Green Lantern ring. It's been passed down through her family for generations. She's not the Green Lantern, she's just hanging onto the ring. And I think she says about 30 years ago, the ring started glowing. It speaks to her. But then the League of Assassins blows up the bridge. And uh, I'm gonna assume they didn't die, but it kind of looks like they did. It was a pretty big train explosion. Cutting back to Antarctica, we, he, uh, we see Strange hanging out with Wonder Woman. And she uses the lasso of truth to kind of break that language barrier between the two of them. And this is probably the best page in the entire book. We're heading straight into some H.G. Wells Journey to the Center of the Earth type stuff right here. Mushrooms the size of trees. King Kong is all over the place. Dinosaurs. I don't know if you can see it here in the very back, but there is a uh, Cthulhu's back here. Or at least something from his family tree is back there. But Themyscira kind of crashed beneath the waves like Atlantis, and uh, the Amazons are now living at the center of the Earth. It's, uh, it's a hollow Earth situation. They have their own little civilization. Um, and, and this is all just being, you know, shown to Strange in quick flashes through the, um, through the Lasso of Truth. Wonder Woman had an entire team of Amazonians with her, and they traveled back up to the surface, but, you know, one by one they started getting picked off. Um, that's where the centipedes came in, actually. Uh, the centipedes killed most of the Amazons. Wonder Woman was the only one to make it up to the surface, which is why she's here in this story. And then we cut over to Mars, where we see... I don't know, it's like a really long set of stairs or a temple or a tower or something. It's hard to tell size here. But the final page is a coffin breaking open with a green hand sticking out. It's Mars. It's a dude with green skin. That's gotta be Martian Manhunter. Has to be. This was good. I would say issue three is definitely better than the first two issues. It really finds its footing here. The art, the art works. The art works. It's not great, but it's not offensive. It's it's not bad. You can tell what everything is, who everybody is. I'm going to say this a four, maybe a four and a half. I, I definitely had a lot of fun reading this one, and I, I'm, I'm enjoying the direction that this is going. Centipedes in Antarctica, or Alaska, Antarctica? Yeah. Exploring the Fortress of Solitude, but there's no Kryptonians. That's the weird thing. We haven't actually found Kryptonians yet, and it's issue three, and it's the Kryptonian Age, but there's no Superman. All right, whatever. That's cool. That's fine. I, I'm honestly, I'm not even upset about that. I just think it's a little weird. I feel like Superman's not going to show up until the final episode, or final issue. I'm going to say out of five, this is a solid four. And this brings us to our top pick of the week, The Ultimates, number three. The cover is Thor versus She-Hulk. At least I assume this is She-Hulk. It's, it's, you know, it's a little hard to tell sometimes. Uh, this one has a story by Dennis Camp and Juan Frigeri, the diabolical genius known as the Maker, used time travel to create his ideal Earth by systematically preventing anyone from ever becoming a superhero and by establishing a secret council of supervillains, the Maker's Council that rules the world from the shadows. But now the Maker is gone, locked away for the next 16 months by inventor Howard Stark. Howard's teenage son, Tony, has taken on the codename Iron Lad and teamed up with Captain America, Thor, Sif, and Doom to set things right. Now they're on a quest to bring on as many heroes to their cause as possible and hunt down the keys to defeating the Maker's Council. Thus far, they recruited the merry duo Giant Man and Wasp and rescued a powerful young woman named America Chavez from the Council's underbelly. So we open with the Pacific Proving Grounds, the birth of the Hulk. Uh, you just get one little glimpse. I'm gonna assume this is Bruce Banner up here. And then, you know, he gets nuked to oblivion. And th this right here, this is my one, one problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm nitpicking here. One problem with this entire story, art-wise, right here. We got an adult head 
on a child's body. It don't look right. Every time we see her, it just don't look right. But, you know, that, that's just nitpicking. All that aside, we see the Hulk's birth, not directly, we don't actually see the Hulk, but we see the explosion that creates him. We see all the people on the nearby islands getting coated in neon green atomic dust. Again, there, there, there we go, we got, it's either a hypersexualized midget or someone doesn't know how to draw children. And we get one of these confidential reports from Operation Castle Gamma, report number one. Everybody has been uh, blacklisted out here. So we don't know who wrote this, we don't know who it's being sent to, but it's a field report explaining how the island is changing after the gamma explosion that creates the Hulk. Honestly, this whole thing reads like one of those uh, early Resident Evil games where you find one of those notes from someone who's probably dead, and the longer you go, the longer you read, the more desperate and honestly just horrifying all of the sounds. They, you know, these people are all mutating. The land itself is mutating. See two lizards fighting each other, and then Thor, Iron Man, and Sif touch down. They fight another lizard. Then we get another confidential report. If you read them both together. There, there's really uh, a hopelessness to this whole thing, but I have changed. Am changing. Nearly three weeks without my radiation suit, eating and drinking and breathing the island. I feel something strange growing inside me. Will I shed my skin and become something sleek and new and blameless? Or will I become something worse than before? I am afraid. Of course you haven't come. Why would you? This is where we belong from the beginning. The Island of Monsters. That is messed up. Like, Banner kicked off this whole project, turned himself into a Hulk, and let his entire team mutate. Refuse to help, refuse to bring him home, just so we could study him. That's what it feels like anyway. But some new creature shows up, kind of Hulkish. Honestly, I, at, at first reading, I thought this might have been the Hulk, and then I remembered he's, he's over in Tibet right now. So th this is some abomination, I guess. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Definitely some kind of abomination. They fight. The creature barely feels or notices anything they do until Thor steps up and really brings down the hammer. At which point, I'm calling her She-Hulk. She may not be She-Hulk. I don't know. She-Hulk shows up, calms the creature down, and he turns back into a baby. Which, holy shit. So everyone on this island is some kind of mutated Hulk thing, right? Holy crap. And we go back to her village, and we get to see just how horrible things are and how lucky she was. We meet Terra, who's literally just nerve endings and a skull. Like a skeleton with nerve endings, that's it. Tara feels everything. The most gentle breeze is agony. For her, life is pain. You want to put a gun in her hand? Holding it will be torture. And this is sorry. He cannot speak or feed himself. We think he got lost in his own big thoughts. He gives no indication that he understands or even sees us. Do you think he will be good for following orders? I'm gonna say this is probably the Ultimate Universe's version of uh, the Master who is like one of the Hulk's biggest enemies. He's just, you know, normal sized green person with a gigantic huge head. I don't even know what the hell's going on with Terra. That, that is, that is rough. I don't even know how you sleep at night. Oh, and then we got a dude with crab arms in the back. And a guy with uh, tusks. For whatever reason, like you, you see what's going on here. Thor and Sif already noted, like they can feel the radiation in the air as soon as they step down on the island. And what does Tony do? He takes off his friggin' helmet. I, I would not be doing that. I'll, I'll give Thor and Sif the pass because they're, as guardians, they're not directly human. Radiation may not affect them the same, but Tony taking off his helmet? Come on, man. They try to recruit She-Hulk, and She-Hulk says, I'll go with you on one condition. Fix this land. Which, I mean, from a logistical standpoint, you're probably gonna have to, like, dig up that topsoil from the entire island. Which means uprooting the trees, destroying all the plants, getting rid of everything. Uh, it's, it's, it's gonna be really hard to do. I'm sure they're just gonna hand wave it away and just, you know, off off panel. They'll be like, oh, well, yeah, we took care of it, and sent in Stark Industries, and you know, whatever. I, I don't know. But the point is, She-Hulk has joined the team. I guess there were hidden cameras on the island or something, because we cut over to Tibet, and the real Hulk is watching this entire thing go down, and he's like, all right, this is going on just far enough. Assemble the immortal weapons. These ultimates are starting to make me angry. The immortal weapons, what the f is that, is that Iron Fist? Are, are you sending in an army of Iron Fists or something? 15 months remaining. This was good. This, this hands down, this had action, this had story. We got a real good look at, 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 at how this world functions and what happened to the Hulk. Because it, it really early on, like the maker says, it didn't matter how many times I tried to erase the Hulk from existence. He's a part of the universe. He will be born, even if it isn't Bruce Banner. So like, if I, if I can't get rid of the Hulk, I might as well get him to work for me. Getting to see how 
that happened and what, what the fallout of that was, that was good. I'm gonna say Ultimates number three. Out of five, that, that's a solid four and a half, five out of five. We're, you know what, fuck it, five, it's five. Five out of five. That's this week's haul. Hope you enjoyed it, check it out next week. And uh, you know, we'll be picking up some more stuff next Wednesday. Stay safe and if you don't, don't get caught. Deuces.